1997. 1997 was a very important year in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and embarked on a different but unique wave of music from new artists that was about to make a different impression on the underground hip-hop scene in the scenic city. This is Off Comes the Mask, the untold story of the rise and fall of FAM Records. I do marketing, promotion, road management, you know what I'm saying? My hands are in a bunch of things when it comes to the uh, music industry. I'm a rapper first and foremost, I'm all the pimp. That's kind of where the name all the pimp come from. I was playing basketball at first. I ended up jumping on the nigga out here in the west side and it got back to the coach. And he suspended me for a few games. And then I ended up catching the charge on, on somebody at school and they took me to juvenile out from school. And he kicked me off the team after that. I come out the next year to try to play ball again. And then it just didn't work. We had a little falling out and I got put off the team again. So after that, that's when I started saying, all right, fuck basketball, I'm gonna try something else. My senior year in school, they had a city wide high school talent show at Tyner High School. I'm going to sit at the time. The talent show had people from Cedar High School, Brainerd High School, Howard High School, and China, the place where they had it at. This is my first time ever doing a show right here, ever. This motherfucker jam-packed, wall to wall, about 2,000 people in there. People only cheer from the people from their school, you get what I'm saying? So this nigga go up, and no matter how, how good he do, only people from his school is cheering for him, you get what I'm saying? So the crowd was real segregated and biased. When I get up there and do my thing, the whole crowd went crazy. the show and I left. One thing that that's about it. Monday morning, the people from the school come to my school during lunchtime and bring me a trophy saying I won first place. And from there, that's kind of what started me as my older pimp. About three months later, I came out with a cassette tape. I think it was like 97, something like that, man. I came to the mall with what they doing, hook. Saw the peas ahead, the uh, t shirt going on, little hood slowing everybody. You know, do the, the hood slow, you know, you how do you holler what they doing? This right here, man, this is the very first, you know what I'm saying, what they doing, goddamn platform right here, man. It was called Mall the Pimp featuring the Battleground Soldiers and Golda. Golda was a female I went to high school with. The Battleground Soldiers was some of my homies from out here in the west side. So we put together a cassette tape. I pressed up 300 copies of it, sold them for $5 a piece. That was my first $1,500 right there off of music. You get what I'm saying? But all this right here started from me winning that talent show. So the talent show is what really launched my career. The Mall the Pimp cassette tape is what made me, got me my first $1,500 off of music. And from that point on, I knew then there was money in this rap game. So this is what I chose to pursue. After the release of Fuck a Mask, the album in the summer of 1998, Fam Records, or Fuck a Mask, had been established, with Shawty Thuggy as CEO and artist, and Maul the Pimp as the first official artist. I, I, started, I was a solo artist at first. I was going to Maul the Pimp thing. I had this little Max sing out called Maul the Pimp featuring, featuring the Battleground Soldiers and Gold. And, uh, me and the Battleground Soldiers had this song called What They're Doing. Like a little, a little hood song, really representing the West Side and shit. Them niggas had some shirts, man, with the mask on the motherfucker. Now, I'm pretty sure, man, if you if you from that era, you probably got one seat somewhere in the goddamn closet somewhere. These shirts were epic, man. They had the mask on, man. They fam, 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 stand for fucking mask. So they had the slogan, what they doing, they had these shirts, man. They was all colored that way. These neighborhood, the rock, they color, you know what I'm saying? Cause you know how they go. Shorter was just getting out of jail. He had did like five years in the pen for robbery. He had a... Uh, he was selling these t-shirts called What They Doing. They had What They Doing rolled all across the t-shirts. We had a song called What They Doing, so that shit kind of went with the t-shirt, you know what I'm saying? When I put out the cassette tape with the Battleground Soldiers, we had a song in there called What They Doing. You get what I'm saying? He ended up hearing the song. So I'm, on, I'm in 12th grade at the time. I'm, I'm on my way to school one morning. I had a 73 Cadillac, long ass beige Cadillac. He had a Nova at the time, you feel me? I'm, on, I'm pulling out the parking lot, bum, 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 bum. He blow me, flagged me down. I said, what's up, bro? He said, hey, man, I heard that tape y'all did, man. That shit tight, man. I'm, I'm trying to get in the studio, too, man. You know, I just got out, man. When the next time you going to the studio? Man. Just so happened, I was going that night. I had a little session at 6 o'clock booked at uh, Block Life Combined Styles. I had a, I had a big influence in that. You know, most of the cats started out of my studio. 
like Dre, Dre was doing his thing. Snoop was his first nigga he invested in. Uh, uh, he put his time into, you know what I'm saying? That, that was me and Charlie, Dre and Snoop. That was us right there. I heard about the die for Smoke Dog first came to me and was like, uh, hey man, it's this dude, man, go open up a studio. It was down here on Market Street, right by the liquor store. Man, dude, open a studio down there on Market Street, man. It's called to die for, man. The man, studio tight as a motherfucker, man. We finna sign with him. I was actually signed to another record label. Uh, my nigga Frank Nita had a record label called uh, To Die For Entertainment, man. We had a studio right there on Martin Street, right down the street from high school. He signed, we had another uh, group from out the west side called uh, West Wayne, which is Blue Ice, Polar Bell, and Bo. They signed with him. Then he had some uh, Red the Moffat, Boston Earl. He had the little twins. They had a nice little roster over there. So they was doing their little thing. But when Smoke signed over there with them, again, like I said, it left me free to go fuck with Shorter. And that's what started Found Records. They time was obligated over there now. You feel me? So they didn't have time to really do what we was doing at the time. So when they got obligated over there, me and Shorter P came together and started doing our thing. And from there came the song, What They Doing, Part 2, and then the song, Fuck A Mess. We released those and started selling those uh, as a two-song CD single for $10. We sold about maybe 500 copies for $10, two songs on the CD. And when you open the CD up, it said, Coming Soon, Fuck A Mess The Album. It was a two-song CD single, but inside it said, Coming Soon, Fuck A Mess The Album. So they let this right here... That's why that was the birth of a dynasty, because this let motherfuckers know what we're doing and what we had coming and who we were. You feel me? From the streets to a CEO, Shouty Thuggy was always a real aggressive and respected person in the street, but also was a smart hustler. Whether he was making it or taking it, he knew how to get the money by any means necessary. Uh, my first impression was he just was your typical rapper, because like I said, we had all kinds of local people, all kinds of CDs, you know. Um, I didn't really differentiate him with anybody else. Like, oh, well, this is just another, you know, another artist. You know, before rapping, he was nothing but a straight up stick up kid. He'll pull up on you, lay you down in front of your mama, your grandma, shoot your cop, shoot your house up, run up in your house. Watch that little nigga. <laughs> Watch him. Watch him. Don't let him know how much you got. I'll fuck with him. I'll spend with him, but I always kept it low. You feel me? He ain't gonna spend too much with him. Cause he gonna come back and get it. Go get him. And shit, he'll goddamn take a nigga shit quick. You don't wanna give him a fuck, man. If he catch you sleeping, that's your motherfucking ass. You know what I'm saying? Most definitely he wasn't no studio gangster. Whatever it take, if he want it, he gonna get it. As a person, first, he was a, he was a hood dude, a, a straight up street nigga, and niggas knew that. I mean, wasn't nothing about him soft, wasn't nothing about him weak. Everything he said in his music is what he really lived and what he really did and what he still would do if he had to. You know, he had his reputation, his reputation preceded him. He can do it by himself or with his entourage. The niggas only saw them ball hit niggas come through through beers. They knew what time it was, you know what I'm saying? The niggas that wasn't rapping, that was in the back room, was the real motherfucking gold, man. Shout was a real street nigga, man. On to the next question. He feel that it's a threat. Oh, we coming. 99% of the shit nigga rapping about, man, on the label, dog. Nigga was doing that shit, man. Shit, you go buy that CD, or you go come out your pocket. We done a show one time at the Viper. Mr. Lucci was there from Houston, Texas. We came out with the masses on. Them niggas got scared, was in the DJ booth, thought a nigga was gonna rob them, man. He came home from the pen and started a fan record, so niggas knew what he was about. You get what I'm saying? And they made his lyrics believable. And that's one thing that's hard to do with these rappers now is to believe what they saying. Because everybody's talking gangster. Obviously, he had done his homework and was trying to figure out the next step to get to, you know, to the next level where he was trying to get to. My first encounter with Shawty was when uh, we was in the studio in Katusa. I was banging out some beats. You know, so I used to be on the beach real hard. I remember Shawty coming in there talking about, uh, how you know he ain't finna sell it to somebody else? My first time me shout out, like, I don't like this motherfucker. <laughs> But but later on, you know, later on down the road, man, he uh he turned out to be a real dude, man, and really showed me love. You know what I'm saying? I was uh, promoting a show at the National Guard Armory. We had a, a lot of local artists on. Somebody came up to me and said, hey, man, you need to get this dude on stage. Uh, he's got a big following. I didn't know who he was at the time. To my surprise, man, everybody knew every word to the song. And at that point, I didn't know, you know what was going on or who he was. He was trying to get into music. I was already into it. He was a hustler, but he wasn't doing the music. He was trying to get into the music. So when he met me, I was a young nigga in the hood coming up doing music. 
he was an OG nigga in the hood who had a hustle, but was trying to get into the music. So the, the it, just, it was just a perfect connection. I remember one day he came in, and uh, I don't know who he was driving that day, but it was a uh, it was a hell of a car. I'll just say that. But uh, <laughs> but but he came in, and I knew this guy was. He just had something about him, you know, that already looked like he was. I mean, confident and just he was just nice to me. Introduced himself, and I introduced myself as the manager, and uh, told me, and I had not gotten. I guess, you know, used to all the, the consignment. And I had heard of him because I saw the CD up there and we had it at one of our listening stations. But, uh, you know, he introduced himself and uh, we looked at the, that's when I looked at his contract and saw all the copies, I guess, that, uh, you know, where we, had, where we had been paid several times. So I knew right then that he was not somebody that didn't know the business. I met him at Cats and you kind of made me buy a CD one time. You know, I, he just kind of came over, like, put his hand, arm around me, like, man, I need you to buy a CD, fam. Come on, fam. So he was like, he was more like that, man. Just a dude that was kind of had that charisma that made you believe in what you were talking about. Well, he looked like a rapper. You know what I'm saying? So the image thing played a lot. He had the brains of a bird, man, how to take music and make hundreds of thousands off of music because he really made that. I seen these chicks coming in. And he had the muscle of Suge Knight, meaning, uh, if you put him to the test and he had to really show you that he really about what he's saying, he would do that. He's somebody that was driven and knew what he wanted to do and uh, and wanted to use me as a vehicle to do it. And I was thrilled to do it. His mentality was always the same as get up and go to work. He had a song called, What They Doing? I mean, everybody chanting, what they doing? What they doing, huh? You know what I'm saying? So like he had to sit on lock. He was a millionaire just in access. He was a beast, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I saw him in the mold of like a, a, another Master P, man. Shorty was eating the streets alive, you know? He knew how to, he knew what the streets was about and he just took the music to the street and with that knowledge and just took it to the street and just took over. I was DJing at the whole note and he started the fan records. He came up and asked me to play a song. I played the song. Then he wanted the mic, but it was time to go. So we had a few words about it. Like, bro, it's time to go. He was telling me, you know, it ain't time to go. I need to get on. Whether if the radio station was fucking with him or not, he'll make his own commercials, pay for his commercials, advertisement. I used to love to see him go into different characters depending on what we had to do. He knew how to come at a street nigga. He knew how to come at the white lady behind the office. He knew how to come at the radio people. He, he had different personalities depending on who we was talking to at the time. He was just, he was just different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, even you know, some dudes, they got the it factor. You know what I'm saying? Shawty, he had, he had the it factor when it came to music, when it came to business. Shawty, Shawty P has a business, man. You can tell he, he, had, he had an unorthodox way of marketing, an unorthodox way of getting you to get CDs. It was kind of like a bully tactic, but it worked. Shawty was a good businessman because he was the first one doing it. You know what I'm saying? He was the first one out here stunting with his label on his truck and... I knew he was about his hustle. I knew he was about his grind. I knew he was gonna do whatever it took to make it pop. It's just one of those cats that I that, that I already knew a lot about what he was wanting to do. Saying he was the perfect nigga to be to do business with. The perfect nigga to do business with. Me and your mom used to walk around see the high school with these man in a box, homie. Battleground soldiers. Shout out to Goldie, man. Oh. And my guy raked up, man, you know what I'm saying? So this shit right here, and if y'all niggas don't believe it, for you young niggas, <laughs> pressed up. This shit real, pressed up, man, you know what I'm saying? Not a scratch on it, you know what I'm saying? You gotta flip this motherfucker on the other side, man, and hear the other songs, you know what I'm saying? So this shit right here showed a nigga that it was money in this shit. I mean, he's younger than me, right? So the, and you see him at, at local talent shows, he was one of those cats that was always around. It's like, damn, I just saw that dude at another talent show. Or I just saw him there or, or at a local studio when I was producing and I was playing. He would always be in the mix. I ain't even know that nigga. That nigga walked up on me in school with these. You know what I'm saying? Like, nigga, look, here you go. So, you know what I'm saying? This, this nigga always instilled the business side in me. You know what I'm saying? Come on, I was always chasing the dollar behind this shit. Well, for a long time, I didn't know who Ma was. I knew I used to always see him around. Ain't nobody never showed me there was a way for me to capitalize on him. He's more negative than me, you know what I'm saying? Because all the shit this nigga can do in the rap is like, I can't do half right now. The nigga is the nigga you want on your team, man. Yeah, for you know sure. What I'm the nigga is the nigga you want on your team, not just because of his resources, 
But because he of the really drive, the yeah, nigga the nigga really. One thing I can say about Marvel, man, he won't stop doing shit. That nigga gonna keep going. That nigga sell goddamn salt to a snail, some goddamn water to a whale. I'm talking about some cheese to Taco Bell, nigga. <laughs> then I realized, oh, he the one handling the business. Ma was a big, 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 big part of, of Fan Records. This nigga went to college, graduated top of his class, man, just to make sure that that business was handled right. When I had to meet Ma, you know, when I found out he, he went to college and went to MTSU and took class, I was like, what? Somebody from the street did this? Ma was the nigga on the road in Nashville going to college and shit, you know what I'm saying? Putting it down to like that, so you know what I'm saying? I fuck with Ma. That was kind of impressive, because, you know, I was in the game and I ain't never do none of that. He went to school for this shit, man. He the business aspect and the music aspect, man. So he's the brains, man. This dude is a bona fide hustler. He knows the game, not only just from the street side, but he took the same damn courses that I took, so I know he knows the game, you know what I'm saying? First brother that I know that was working in the street that actually had a, a contract, you know. Uh, me and him, we've always talked and, you know, We've, uh, you know, knew each other from the streets and knew each other from being in the scenes. But that business aspect, a lot of cats don't have business mind. You look at Maude Pimp, got pulls up, braided up. I always represent his chat or represent his brand and his label, what he's going on. And it was just not that, the conversation. We slide the paperwork over to you, look at it, and you see that the basis to cover from venues, riders, expectations, uh, setting the, the, the stage times setting mic checks, setting sound checks, uh, and holding people accountable. He was already in the game before Found Ruckers even existed. Ma was there from day one. Ma the Pimp was um, Found Ruckers. Wasn't nobody on that label before, nobody but Shorty Duggan and Ma the Pimp. Me and him built that label from the ground up, you know what I'm saying? But it was like, he was gonna be the CEO and an artist, but I was gonna be his first real, like, artist artist. So for all y'all that don't know, now y'all know, dawg. Yeah, he's the brains behind shit. He a, he a staple, you know what I'm saying, in, his, in the uh, Chattanooga music game. He a staple in the fan rappers movement. He was going out of town, out of state, visiting people, and like I said, and doing uh, videos with him. Not just visiting him, doing videos with him. Oh, Bill. Chattanooga Blue Boy, what I call it. But Ma was the first artist on Fan Rebels, and he the reason why Fan Rebels began. Um, little did I know, he went to the same college that I went to. And then when I found that out, and he majored in the same thing that I majored in, then that's when I knew, I was like, okay, I need to figure out, you know, what's up with this cat. Every independent label got to have somebody with a vision. I start to realize that Ma is kind of carrying his vision out. You know what I'm saying? Kind of carrying Shorty's vision out. They, it's like they're working collectively on what's going on. The shit started with him and my older pimp, man. You know what I'm saying? Before I even picked up the microphone, man. You know what I'm saying? My older pimp been rocking with this nigga since day one, A1. Without, without my older, I don't know, I don't know what a uh, fan thing would have been there. You know what I'm saying? Because he, 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 he had been there from day one, and, uh, you know, and he, he been there uh, 10 seconds ago. You know what I'm saying? So, you know what I'm saying? It, it, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to my older pimp. I know the real out here in the street. Ma the Pimp, he's certified. You know what I mean? I don't even have to see it. West side, east side, south side, north side, you know, he's certified. I realized Ma knew the game. He was learning from a professional angle, which which was needed at the time, but we still needed now in the independent music business. From Fan Ruggers to, to 423 Pimp Holly, and the transition of to, uh, uh, coming up, becoming up from an artist to a boss, so he can keep that movement alive. Fam still live on through the homie, you know what I'm saying? And through us too, you know what I'm saying? Cause it, it's a West Side thing. Bro, bro really elevated that shit, you know what I'm saying? To the another level because when niggas, niggas was on some street shit, you know what I'm saying? They man went and, and got that business right so he can so he can spread that light on the rest of us so we'll know how to go out and get checks for that shit. I'm all the pimp. One man, I'm all the pimp, the artist on stage. One man, I'm all the pimp, the engineer when I'm mixing my album. Then one minute I'm out of pimp, the promoter when I'm going to the radio station, getting them to play my shit. Then one minute I'm out of pimp, the businessman when I'm at the cable company doing the advertisement. Then I'm out of pimp to collect when I'm coming to the new business and get my motherfucking money at the end of the day for doing all that shit I just said right there. I holler.
I don't drink bubbly. <laughs> yeah, fam, rapper still doing it for the 2002. Fam, thug, fuggalation coming to your local rapper store soon. We done hooked up with Pastor Troy and them down South Georgia boys. Being is done picked up, baby. We don't get it, I'm at the borderline. We we was a squad too, you know what I'm saying? And, and we were coming, you know, we, we everybody had their own, you know what I'm saying, little little style or whatever. My all the artists I can remember that was on fam records. My all the pimp. I feel like it's really I feel like it's really important to lay in the uh, music scene for the foundation. I feel like honestly we like the uh the forefathers slash pioneers or whatever you want to call it for the, the gangster rap music scene in Chattanooga. Because gangster rap don't really have like a life. Or an existence in Chattanooga with some found records laid that foundation. We come in all with this shit. This for my ride, I say I'm thug until we clock out this bitch. Boy, this is West Side shit. We come in all with this shit. Vinny the Shaw. Nigga from my hood named Shouty. Named Brian Herb, nigga named Shouty P. Shouty came at me, man, and, and was like, man, I want you to get you on a song. So get me on that one song. Led the man, we recording all the time. So next thing you know, we got this little label started with, with Maul and Shawty and, and well, shit, that, that's, nigga, that's the root. The label called Fam Records. My understanding on life is harsh. My lyrics, they kind of downtone a little bit, but you, you can hear what lies beneath is still that same harsh shit. I try, to, I try to tone it down a little bit because we trying to get a little more money, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I'm not going to cut no corners. I'm going to get to your raw. So you got in stores from one year. Butcher, shitty shawl. How can I forget the butcher? Shitty shawl, the motherfucker butcher, nigga, 2002. Nigga, what you gonna do, nigga? Leave your body full of chalk, nigga. Come to the dog, try to fuck with me. Boy, I ain't no mouth. You's a chump to me, you know? Well, my nigga shitty shawl, the butcher, man. Straight up motherfucking crazy ass nigga. He in and out. You know what I'm talking about? His mind and his elevator don't go all the way to the top. He a real nigga, though. He thorough. I fucks with him. Shitty shawl, butcher, what up, man? But I love fam, man. You know what I'm saying? That's that's my first contract I ever had with fam rapping. Me, son, got it. Two G's on the west side. This for the motherfucking killing. Two my toe is mac and die. They look me dead in the eyes. I can't get tell me what I'm feeling. This fam still shit is about to blow through the ceiling. We just out here in the west side, man. What's up, guys? Yeah. What's up, okay. What's up, baby? Yeah. You all right? Yeah. Chilling, chilling. Yeah. Chilling. Yeah. What's up, guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We was out here chilling, doing our thing. You know me. OG let out and moving mad. My nigga Peter Wayne, where's Wayne really is going down, nigga? This is why we do this shit. Uh, we in the fam headquarters, Lord, I'm saying in the lab. Brace and case, blaze on the street, kick up nothing but heat. The city come with the flame. The nigga that told y'all boys out of real. Fam was really like really showing it. Like they got the money and the muscles to prove it, you feel me? And they got all the hardest artists, you feel me? Young ballers. The psychos. We've been we've been in a fam studio from 12, 15 to 8, 25. You know what I'm saying? Eight hours strong. Drop the platinum here. All day work. Drop the platinum here. Business usual. You know what I'm saying? Might might hear from us next month. Drop another platinum here. Go on, we get some quick hits. Oh, he's gonna be on tour. Man. You know what I'm saying? Hey, man. We signed out. Fam, thug. Miles, Pim, Peter Wayne. CEO. Show him, guys. Shout out to the presence of an entourage. Fam Records was known for having a strong entourage. Some were artists and some were people from the street who were just affiliated with the label. The aura that they gave off was definitely one that demanded respect, and it was always consequences for those that disrespected. <laughs> when people see people running with you and believing in, in the brand, believing in the label, believing in the music, that's important. The thicker your entourage is, the better it makes your movement look. When we showed up 30 deep, niggas already knew what time was. If you didn't know, you was going to be like, who the fuck are these niggas right here? It was about a hundred of us. Everybody need a street team. Uh, and at that point, we didn't have internet we didn't have a lot of the mediums that that can get your music out niggas was really out here you know what i'm saying running down on niggas man you know what i'm saying 
you just gonna see a cloud of, of dust cause nigga gonna mind kick your drawers up your ass. I remember several times nigga disrespected and got wound, but we were so deep, man. I didn't even know everybody. When you got your entourage and you got your, your crew, it's just something about like the energy and the vibe that they get like, bang, you know what I'm saying? Who are these niggas? Whoever from the hood went to the club that night, wherever we performed that, they was our entourage. We couldn't keep them off the stage. Everybody's a promoter. Everybody is a uh, on the street team for the for the label. The entourage is, is, is vital. You know what I'm saying? You gotta have high, uh, no limit had that had their big ass roster, the family had roster. You didn't have the internet, you know, you couldn't really fake anything. You had to move as a solid unit. And the fam was deep. It helps in the fact that that presence is there. When you hit the stage, you got 30 wild cats on the stage and they already vibe. They already vibe, but you know, listening to your music, they already know your hooks, they already know your lyrics. Very big, important press because if you ain't got nobody following you, then you ain't nobody. Say if it was 30 niggas, maybe six of us was, or uh, 10 of us was artists. The rest of them was niggas from out the hood who was just supporting what we did. You know what I'm saying? So it was never no room for no disrespect. And if you did, you got dealt with. Good day with the sales. It's been a good day with the record sales. A very good day with the record sales. We're gonna go out and smoke and go to the mall and get some clothes. Well, come on and see the artist. Well, I don't have no money. I don't have no paper. Oh, I don't have no paper. Well, I do. I got a pen. So we're performing at the National Guard on me. And some clown, I hear Vinny, Vinny and Charlie done stopped rapping. They cussing at some nigga in the audience. They cussing at this nigga. Ah, I'm like, what the heck? They so much that the police go snatch him and drag him up out of there. Cause you know, the, I, the police know who these folks is, but this cat don't know who these folks is. Police snatch him out the thing. So fast forward to about a week later, I'm riding through Boom Height, I'm jamming it for my ride. I got it banging out the car. And I stopped to holler a couple of my foes out there. And a the nigga pulled up and I'm like, man, they ain't them fam niggas. He going off the same nigga. He talking about Larry got his baby mama out of town somewhere. I'm like, bro, you tripping. First of all, Larry wasn't up there. And D, you, you tripping with some niggas that'll do something to you, man. Man, you and them niggas, I'll do something to you. I said, all right, bitch. I'm going out there. Oh, the scene was turmoil. The scene was turmoil. We was doing anything we was gonna do to get money. It didn't matter. Uh, what I talked about on them records is what I live. Um, anything from home invasions to get them kidnapping. You know, that's what we was doing, man. And we were doing everything that was possible to get the music off the ground. The downfall to having an entourage is that you judged and, you know, typically judged by the company that you keep. If I was just looking at a group like that, I wouldn't want to stay away from because there's too many of them. There was too many of them. Fam wasn't just no uh, rappers, wasn't no studio rappers. He was some real street cats, for real, for real, out there doing it every day. When you get into um, these lights, people start analyzing who's around you. Those lives sometimes foreshadow or give a bad light to the artists. But if you disrespect us, we coming for your ass, and you niggas know what time it is. We we'll beat you. Just that simple. We gonna beat you. The fam entourage was anywhere from 40 to 60 to 70, maybe 80 deep. You fuck with the entourage, man, you know, you go get your ass stomped out. And um, that's just what it was. Some people just gonna be around just to kick it, you know, just to get in the club free, just to holler at chicks. Got to be able to know who to keep around, who to take where. The entourage, they might be involved in certain things also that might not be a positive impact on the label. They involved in any kind of illegal activity. It's going to be a reflection on the label, period. You get out of line, man, your motherfucking shit going to get cracked. Basically, you can be tied up, duct tape, whatever it is, you know what I'm saying, man? When they jumped off, they were wreck shop, and they were known to wreck shop, so, you know, they were doing it the way it had to be done, you know? You had some cats that was just street dudes that didn't know how to uh, separate street and business. It was going to hurt you in the end because at, at some point the brand was going to be fucked up. Right here, the studio. This is the studio. We done had fun up in here. Oh, we done had a ball. 
My business trying to take me down. Still my sis going platinum all over right now. Look at me now, put it down with the best to come. If you think that you can bring it, come and get you some. Well, I, when I was there, uh, the first artist I produced for, for was Sean Gotti. He was, I guess, he was a relatively new artist from Memphis, and uh, the song I produced was "Fuck with Me" that was on the Fam Thug Lay Thug uh, soundtrack. And then uh, I met OG Larry Dog, and um, one night me and Household cooked up, and that was the recognized song, which was on the Fam Thug Lation. Even though I felt like everybody was from different sides. They, they claim different stuff, whatever. But when we was in the studio, it was all about music. Oh, man, man. Nigga getting in there and getting it in, man. You know what I'm saying, man? Nigga getting in that motherfucker and getting out, man. Nigga, niggas wasn't in there playing, man. Nigga getting in that motherfucker dropping and getting up out of there, man. Nigga wasn't on no bullshit, man. And when we was in there, nigga dropping nothing but heat, man. Hey, <laughs> I ain't know you a flow like that, Peter Wayne. How up? Right now, we're in front of uh, the Fam Record Studio. This is the official Fam Record Studio. This was, uh, we opened up in 1998, you know what I'm saying? Right after we released the fucking Mads album in enough units to sold in the street to get our own studio. You know what I'm saying? This is where we made our studio at. This is where it all started, right here. This is how the studio came about. The first album we did, fucking Mads, we recorded that whole album at To Die For Entertainment. That's where we recorded the whole album at. The whole time we was always down there recording, of course, he was, you know, Shuttle was paying for the studio time down there. He was always say every time, man, I need to get my own shit, man. We need a studio, man. We need a studio, man. We need a studio. He used to always say that. He's the type of nigga, if he say something two or three times, y'all already know he's going to start focus on making it happen. You know what I'm saying? So he would always say, we need our own studio. In the middle of us recording at To Die For, he met this white man who had a studio in a mansion up off of Fort Wood by 3rd Street by Erlanger. You know what I'm saying? The white man had this big boy studio up in his attic in a mansion up there. Went up there one time, did a few little songs that never came out. And then, coincidentally, the man started smoking crack. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. He started smoking crack. So, with that being said, without going into the details, Shawty finessed him out the studio once he started smoking. Once he bought the studio equipment from the guy, the next thing was, and keep in mind, we still recording the fucking ass album, but he done bought all this equipment. He ain't got nowhere to put it. His next thing was, man, I need to build him, man. I need to build him, put all this shit in. I need to build him, man. I need to build him. About two months after the fucking Mads album came out, he said, man, it's a building over there on Dawson Avenue in East Chat, man. Dude want X amount of dollars a month for it. I'm finna get that motherfucker. That's the last I heard about it. Next time I saw him, he had the motherfucker, you know what I'm saying? He had the big Mexican board, the glass room. He, you know what I'm saying? He made you want to go out. When you came in his studio, it laid with all the albums, you know what I'm saying? And it was back in the day. You feel me? He had top of the line everything. Since 12, it's now 6, you add up hours. <laughs> 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 the vibe in the studio at Fan Right when we were recording, it was love, man. It was love every time. It was like family. We were like family, man. You know what I'm saying? Until we get it back started. Uh, yeah, uh, here we come. Uh, Shit don't stop like the beat from a motherfucking car. Uh, uh, the five foot feet, uh, five foot uh, feet, five uh, foot uh, coming at you. It, it, it was amazing energy because everybody fed off each other. And you gotta understand, this wasn't just a bunch of collective dudes that just had a studio. These dudes had talent. <laughs> Just coming to my world, 
was always lit. Everybody treated each other with, with the utmost respect. Coldest rappers ever touched down in the chat, baby. What a deep cold. What a deep bitch. We still play his rap songs today. Bruh, bruh, cold. Now, I know, but his music, you know what I'm saying? I'm a fan of his music like a motherfucker, you feel me? And then when I got with fam, that, that's that's how the buzz got to me. You know what I'm saying? By, by Big Benny. You know what I'm saying? Hearing his songs and shit. Everybody ran around bumping that shit, especially that, uh, that, this for my ride up, east side up. Sammy came at me, man. Oh, uh, and asked me if I wanted to do like some music with him and shit. I said, run it. So we started dropping shit, and at first I wasn't taking the shit serious. But I started noticing like, <coughs> damn. Motherfuckers fucking with this shit, you know what I'm saying? Certain local product is gonna sell just because, you know, people who know the people are gonna wanna come in and get it and be like, oh, you know, I know that guy, you know, but then like, it had a little bit of that, but then people would get the CD and be like, well, this is actually quality product, you know? It's like, well, yeah, I bought it because I know the guy, but now I'm gonna, now I'm glad I have it and I'm gonna tell other people they need to get it. Uh, this one actually sold and sold out and we ran out and we sold many. Most most things on consignment that we got, a lot of times, kind of was doing it as a favor. Stood out about Benny compared to the normal consignment. So we usually would get like maybe five or 10 copies of a normal consignment product because it wouldn't be that big of a seller. And if it was, it would be very slow and take you know several weeks or months before we saw, went through even 10 copies. But with Benny, you know, it was, after a week or two, it's like, oh, well, we need another 120 copy. <laughs> but, you know, I'm talking about sometimes they're getting checks for $30 or 40 when it's been on the shelves for two or three months. Whereas with you guys, I had to be on the phone almost, or Gila, you know, every you know, week just dropping off more copies. So I, I can't think of anything that even came close, to be honest with you. So... Just night and day difference. Night and day. First time I heard Rock On, it was in somebody's car. You know what I'm saying? And they were asking me had I even heard it. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, uh, we had a record on radio. You know what I'm saying? And like one of the hottest local records at the time. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the only local record getting that many spins on the radio. And uh, as you heard this, I was like, uh oh. So when they told me it was coming out of Fam. I said, show to feed them doing it like that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So uh, it was super cool, though. It was super cool that the no more people in the city was pushing. I'm going to give you this story. I was riding on 37th and 4th Avenue. I pulled up to that stop sign. You know where that spot is. Yeah. Over there by the sun. I pulled up to that stop sign. I was playing a song. It was a little dude. He couldn't have been no more than 12. He had on his backpack. He was at the stop sign. He, he flagged me down. I said, what's up, man? He was like, what's up, man? You you grab a fan rapper, don't you? He said, I know you. I said, what? Now, this is a little dude. You know, all our shows, you had to be at least about 16, at least, to go there and show. I said, yeah. He was like, man, you got a CD? I was like, I ain't had number one rock on CD, dude. And you know, we're hard to get these CDs. I'm like, yeah. And then it's a little kid's pen advisor. You know what I'm saying? I said, yeah, yeah, I got one. He was like, he said, man, let me have it. I didn't know how big it was going to be until you go into the club, like Battle Hoos or whatever club was jumping at the time. They playing for my riders. And it's going crazy. Or when you get out of school at Burnham, everybody pulling off. At the time, I had a Honda Accord, four tens. You playing, can I get a nub? Baby, want to say? It was like instant classic. Oh, I got dope for days. 
Like, even though we was in high school, we weren't selling no dope like that. Like, look, we, well, he made you feel like you was doing it. So it was like, that's what we was on. Like, it was, once you heard the music, you knew what it was. Come on, man. Support a local group, man. And that shit hard as hell. I know, man. It ain't making them do that. If your speakers ain't doing that, it ain't mama. If your speakers ain't doing that, don't put it in the CD player. I think that they really liked that album over the other ones just because he was the local and he was, um, I think it's really the advertising too that um, that's put into the, the CD. I didn't really see the real impact of what was going on. I think I was at the Bay one night and it came on. It's like damn, that record going down. People, people going going off. People feeling feeling the record for real. So uh, that was the first time I had really had a chance to see the effect of it, man. But uh, it's, it's it's still a classic though, in Chad. It's still a classic. But that joint, man, was the biggest album. I can remember an artist putting that in the city. That joint, that was that joint, that was amazing. Oh, that was one of the main, I'm saying, Vinny, Vinny did that joint, this one would do it right. I still rock that joint, to this day. I, niggas was telling me, like, nigga, this shit going crazy, I ain't hear your music. I wasn't really, like, thinking about the impact it would have, you know about the impact it had on me. I'm how I'm finna top this. How I'm finna do this rock on. But it was like me and him was at two different genres, you feel me? He was at the... He was and I was you feel me? And he was still, you know what I'm saying? He was still doing his thing and I was and it, and I saw I didn't see it like okay, I'm finna take him to war like I'm finna take everybody else to war. You feel me? I ain't I ain't feel like that way toward him and he always embraced me. And I got him on my new album, Turn Up Is Real. It's a lot of them songs, like it's about eighty eighty percent, you know, and I made on I know Ebo and Red Mafia Balls also you know, co-produced the album, but, um, you know what I'm saying, I was featured on songs like Who the Man, or uh, Green Paper, um, Here We Go Again, uh, Lord, man, that's a lot, man, it, it, it brings back memories, I think, when, when we dropped that album, I think it was, I, 2000, it was, it was around 2000, man, you know, man, it, it, it kind of like pioneered Chattanooga, you know what I'm saying, it kind of pioneered the South, really, man, because, like, they took hold of, it, you know what I'm saying, that was a dope ass album. We've got a, a program called Street Flavor, so we were always looking for, you know, giving cats a shot to at least get their record played on the air. And uh, Vinny was just one of those, another one of those cats that was, you know, Big Vinny. I mean, you don't know who Big Vinny is. It's like, no. Nah. And then when you when you finally saw Big Vinny, you now what the fuck they call him Big Vinny. Uh, but at the same time, dude had bars. And uh, he, him and his entire crew, it was the same thing. Vin the Shaw album Rock On sold 10,000 copies out of the store. Out of the store. It's not to count the hand-to-hand -hand sales in the street. You know what I'm saying? And the thing about that album right there, which is a cool thing, all right, before Rock On came out, we had put out the Fuck Ass album in the street. You feel me? It was packaged up, but it was in the street. After that, Shaw put out an album called Fam Life 2000. In the streets, and we had a few more little things we put our hand in hand in the street. Rock On was the first album that came out in the store, for us packaged up and plastered with a barcode on it. You know, you would always, if you if you coming into the into radio station, you always want to know what was the next thing, who's the next, you know, who is this, who's who's popping from D Cooley to you know to you, you name it. You wanted to know who the next person was, and then Vinny just happened to be one of those cats. And that was Vinny the Sharks album. So when Rock On came out in the store as the first store album, the first album that we had commercials running for on TV and all this shit, people looked at Vinny the Shark like, like he was the first artist on Found Records because his album was the first one out of the store. I was one of the premier artists on Found Records at that time. And I did my first my first solo CD called Rock On. And that shit took off, man, you know what I mean? I did not expect it to do what it did, but at the same time, it had something that none of the other consignment products had is I heard people talking about it before I even got it so I knew there was a buzz and uh, it didn't take long to realize that cats did have a history before me and that it was the go-to place for you know tickets and things like that but I'm not aware I, I'm not even sure if they even did consignment before I got there and you might know that if you were going in but either way 
I, I did, it, 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 it surprised me, but after after that, I, I kind of was prepared and expected it, and uh, was one of the leading stores as far as sales go, and that's that's one of the first reasons why these are the others. Almost 200 copies of this in a week, uh, roughly eight days, nine days, probably probably a couple thousand. I was pretty proud to be a part of that, um, just because it's it's local. It's your it's your people, you know, in your own town, and they're they're right there at the same level as um, a mainstream artist. You know, it's makes you kind of proud to to know somebody like that, and they, you know, and you see them come in the store. It just was the marketing thing that 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 fam was doing at the time. It was our best seller for probably about six months, eight months, which usually it doesn't matter if it's I mean juvenile, whoever, Snoop, you know, they're using my best seller for two or three weeks, but. It, it was a big bulk of our our week. I mean, if we take away this product, uh, the weeks that I was the number one store, we were the number one store, uh, it would have knocked us down to probably, you know, six or seven. Well, you could definitely tell an increase in, in volume of sales and customers in the in the store. Probably, I don't want to, double maybe. It helped our sales of other product because people were coming in to get the fam stuff. We had the bestseller list right when you walked in, and they remained in the top, at least top six, you know, and that was right up there with the, the big artists. I know that as soon as, pretty much as soon as they were brought in, they were sold out. In my opinion, I think the reason for the sales that we had is because how short it was. Sort of like baby on cash money or something, man. I'm talking about short, pull up on your man, got about 40 CDs in the trunk, you see that thing on his hip. You know what I'm saying? Look here, man, don't get by too. Buy all four of these motherfuckers. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Oh man, stop! Oh, man. Get up! Get up! Get up! Man, fuck, that's a sale, nigga. It's business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nigga, that's on tape. <laughs> <laughs> he forced the shit on you. If you didn't like it, then you was finna hear about it regardless. They was in your face, like, buy this. You need this, fam. Almost to the point where we almost needed a security guard. <laughs> I mean, it was that, not in a violent way, but just people getting excited about it. Selling like crazy. Go through the cash double. They are selling like crazy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They sell, they're selling like crazy. I have a receipt. They owe you $3. If you like one of the CDs, they're probably going to buy two or three others. The checks kept coming, and people, we kept running out. Um, so then I knew that it was a... Uh, like I said, it's a brand. We were more prepared by the time Shoddy came out. We are like, okay, if this is going to do anything like Vinny, we got to be prepared from the get-go not to be caught surprised and short on product. Certain groups, you know, the Rolling Stones have the little tongue logo. They don't, it's, people know it's the Rolling Stones. It's just, you know, they've been around forever. So with you guys, if you're on fam records, then... Yeah, I mean, they're gonna, if they like this, they're gonna like this. They even questioned me, Music City, because, I, you know, I don't know if they thought maybe there was a scam going on, but I don't think they had ever, uh, you know, like, are you sure you're selling this many, you know? Like, they were writing checks as fast as I was selling the CD. That's your payers right there. Since 98, that's what been paying fam records like that. Music City Records Distributors Incorporated. That's what been paying fam records since 98. Hi guys, can I help you? Uh, Jamal here. Uh, do you have a check for Jamal next time? I don't write yet, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> I always get a slight delay with the money. Slight delay, you know. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that, though. Good to see you, right, Mom. Thank you, buddy. We was already selling thousands of units. We had a, we had a video already doing that. Thousands of units, getting checks for like three and four thousand a week. We finally understood that, you know, shooting a video to some of these songs that a lot of people are listening to will help boost the album sales. Fam just had that mystique. You know, it was a, it was a hardcore street label. And and, uh, and that was a time period when, when everybody wanted to be street or wanted people to feel like this. So everybody wanted to be affiliated with it. And plus, they just the way Fam mashed out with their music. And the major part of it is that our music was good music. They always were asking for fam record, you know, always wanting to know the release date and coming in when they're immediately when they're uh, released. I do remember Shawty having the big uh, statue of himself, you know, people like that. 
the reason fam, you know what I'm saying, had had such a, a, a how people were drawn to fam, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was kind of like during the same time, you know, No Limit was doing their thing, you know what I'm saying? It uh, we we were kind of like on on that on that same tip. You know what I'm saying? But we we were repping Tennessee. Bam, motherfucking records, goddamn. All the back. The West Wayne Willis, Peter Wayne, and also Maul the Pimp. Going cop there, you hear me? Also, we got the young Bowler, straight flouts, and doing their thing, so that's the West Side. We also got the Psycho, they got four and two, you hear me? The visual boosted the album sales. You follow what I'm saying? So it was basically like another marketing tool that we learned that, that we learned was uh, beneficial in doing what we was doing. After that, you start seeing other niggas shoot videos and put DVDs out and all that shit right there. But it, remember where it started at? They gonna win first. You know, you gonna have your cats to jump up, have something go viral, but. Groundwork is still just as important as it always was, man. Don't don't miss that piece. Shawty did promotion all he all the time. He had the fan van, he had all the time, everywhere he went. I think that was a big part of it. Uh, the key behind selling selling multiple albums from one independent label to me is just brand. Well, I'm sure the point in time that people know a mask on it, we want to pick it up. There's gonna be some, some good and raw we want to hear. Mall and Shawty and people like that, they worked, they promoted the product, and so they put a lot more effort into the selling and the promotion of the CD than. A lot of people do. They just put it in the store and expect it to just sell. For the 2004, Fam Records presents Maul the Pimp, Show It To Me, the DVD video featuring Haystack, Trick Dad, Napa Root, 8-Ball, Redman, and many more. This DVD also contains triple X-rated bonus footage. See Maul the Pimp live on the set of Snoop Dogg's Black Girls Gone Wild. You wouldn't want to miss this. Also go behind the scenes with Maul the Pimp in the studio with Snoop Dogg as he records the PIMP remix. Show It To Me, the DVD, in stores now. You must be 18 or older to buy this. Universal Records. By the spring of 2001, the Fam Records buzz had reached New York City and caught the attention of an A&R at Universal Records named Dino Duvalier, and the label was invited to the office to discuss a possible business venture. This is this what happened Universal Records right here. This is this how it happened. All right, uh, at the time, it was a dude who had a TV show. Now, I never met this guy before. I never met him. A guy named Ed Owens. He, was, he had a little TV show around here. He had a little TV station around here. You know what I'm saying? He had done, had done got, you know, he went up there and rented some, some advertisement from him, right? Shorter was renting advertisement from him, running commercials on the TV show. The guy Ed had a relationship with uh, Dino Duvalier. From Universal Records. Him and the Dino nigga had had some dealings before. You know what I'm saying? Probably met him at a convention or something or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Dino was the same A and R who brought cash money to the to the uh, to the labels in Universal. So Dino had a nice uh, respect love in the industry. So Ed and Dino had some kind of relationship. However, they met. He he knew the guy. So the guy Ed eventually called Dino and was like, Hey, y'all got fam records down here, man. These guys are hot in the city, man. They're doing numbers. He called Dino. Yo, I got a uh, Eventually, Ed set up a meeting to uh, Charter can go to New York and meet with Dino at Universal Records. We get called, we get to New York, we had to fly to New York, they were going to sign a nigga to a record deal and shit. Vibe going up there, man. It was a long drive, man. It was about 13, 14 hours. But you know, we having a ball, man. So, you know, we get there. It was me, Shorter, House Wolf, Big Van. We pull up, we pop the we pop the hatchback on the van. We got that uh drummer boy playing, you know what I'm saying? Finna check in in the hotel. You gotta make 
people believe that it's bigger than it really is. Everybody just rush the van, you know what I'm saying? We getting them CDs and everything, everybody bumping, you know what I'm talking about. People feel like they try to, you try to come up off of them, they not gonna feed into it. That's, that's one of the biggest pieces to being able to market and promote your product is really, I used to call it building an illusion, you know? But if they feel like you already got it in motion, everybody wants to be a, a part of the win. They feeling it, man. We we from down south, man. We up on the east coast, man. We shut the whole street down, man. Stop trafficking everything, man, before we checked in, man. Now, when Shorter told me what was going on, I'm telling him, I'm saying, hey, bro. I said, who you finna meet with? Dino who? Devalier? I said, listen. I said, hey, bro, that's the same nigga that got cash money signed, dog. Cash Money got a label deal with them. You feel me? A distribution deal with them. I said, so if you finna meet with this nigga, you need to finesse that, bro. Because he the type of nigga, if he see something, he's smart enough to act on it. I'm telling him this. Bam did that masterfully. I remember when the New York trip popped off because we took our trip two weeks later. You know what I'm saying? And, and met with some of the same reps. So we knew that it was, you know, it, it was kind of going down. Or at least everybody believed that it was about to go down. They got different floors up in that motherfucker. But Different departments, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Right, like right. the movie department yeah, or right, remote, whatever, yeah. Right. Man, I'm talking about we're in the ride as soon as we get up out there, motherfucker, nearly. We going to Universal, I ain't never been in nothing like that, you know what I'm saying? I'm walking down the hallway, I see pictures of cash money, you know, the dirty boys. So, you know what I'm saying? We go up there, man. We go up on the eighth floor. They got all the albums on the wall. Mm -hmm. They got the headsets on, they got the flat screens in there, you know what I'm saying? They call it, you know, fam rappers, you know what I'm saying? So they trying to see what it do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nigga, what? Yeah. They say, who is the fam rapper? <laughs> fam, y'all, no, we waiting on you. You ain't got no beef. You ain't got no y'all. Come on in. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
first thing that came to my uh, head when uh, Vinny's situation popped up first was damn because you know you always want that first cat to like really pop because if they pop then everybody else all they need to do is get in line if they if they were gonna do all of the stuff that they were supposed to do oh man when big Vinny got first got arrested man uh it hurt me to my heart man because they just got back from new york two days later i heard that they got big Vinny, you know and i broke down you know what i mean i seen it it's crumbling in you know what i mean but i just didn't know when it was gonna happen he wasn't going to tell him, so he done got caught with all that. He didn't get no bond, and he stayed in there, maintained and held it, and did it. Vinny had the dope in the motherfucking safe, yeah, or whatever it was, and the police came in, found the dope, found the motherfucking the gun, and um, that's how he ended up going to the feds. When I heard it was the feds, I'm like, shit, we can't do shit. Me and Shawty was together. See, we were paranoid in the motherfucker. So when they, when they happened, a nigga called his phone and shot it down and literally dropped that motherfucker. My ex-girlfriend, who I was with at the time, she didn't want to call me with it. She called me and was like, Jamal, they said Big Vinny got picked up. He got caught some dope at a hotel room and the feds got him. He ain't got no bond. This is my girl telling me this now before I hear from any niggas. This is my girl telling me this. They said he ain't got no bond. He got caught some dope in the hotel room. What the fuck's you talking about? I called my homie Big Mike. I said, what's, I said, what are they talking about? Yeah, man, they called him this and that, blah, 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 man. Yeah, man, they, they ain't letting him out right now. Then I talked to Shorty after I talked to Big Mike. He basically pretty much said the same shit. Then I turned the news on, and I see the shit on the news. You feel what I'm saying? He was on Channel 3, 9, and 12. Fam Records artist, uh, Vincent Malvo, a.k.a. Vinny the Shark, was caught with this, 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 this. You know what I'm saying? The first thing I heard when Vinny got picked up by the figures was, fam was over with. You know what I'm saying? So... They were like with Vinny because he had that Rock On CD or whatever. So they thought that Rock On, so they thought by him getting locked up that, you know, when nobody really, you no know, supporters like, because, you know, Vinny, you know, he, he had a hit back then. I saw it on the news. And the first thing that came to my mind was, man, we done because he had a universal deal. They had just come back from New York. You know, everybody was excited about that. So the first thing that came to my mind, that's it. And all they kept saying on the news was local rap artists, fan records, rap artists, Benny the Shark. I don't even, I don't, they may have even mentioned the Universal deal, but they kept just pushing that part on it. You feel what I'm saying? It's on the news. It's always bad if somebody go to jail for anything, no matter what it is, especially if it's a federal situation. The positive part about it is it added to business. You get what I'm saying? It made his album sales take off through the roof. I felt like we were being watched a little bit, but shit, that shit said, after that, after that, I ended up going to the field my goddamn self. You come from a, possible situation that could take everybody out of the out of the city to this right here from new york universal meeting to damn caught with dope in the hotel room so my first thought was like man what the fuck bro come on now we got a phone call that big Vinny had just got hit at the hotel room and shit we just sick as hell but then we ended up going back to the house and uh, trying to find out everything was going on and we got more word that you know the situation on how you got jammed up or whatever. We pretty much just sit down, just don't find out. The bad part about it also, in the end, it put the feds on the label. The feds start watching everybody on the record label right there. Because when they got him, they tried to get him to give statements against uh, against Shorter, and he wouldn't. So since he didn't give them nothing, they made them watch the label even more right there. You feel what I'm saying? So now you got everybody under surveillance based off of one artist getting caught with whatever he got caught with. Get in it. Stay low key and get out of it. Use your money to bring up positive things. So you, because you can't, you can't be rich out of this game. You gonna, it's gonna stop for you one day. So you got to turn your money over positive. The fall of an empire. After the arrest of Vinny the Shark, Fam Records remained successful in terms of album sales and releasing music. Shouty Thuggy was smart enough to use the publicity as a marketing strategy, but behind the scenes, a lot of the artists and entourage members were catching cases due to their activity in the street. Man, I heard about it. I got a phone call, man. The source told me, like, man, they just hit Shouty Thuggy house, man. I'm like, God damn it, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, shit. I don't think he had to do was just chill, man. We had this music shit popping, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, you can't tell that to a real street nigga, you know what I'm saying? They had come out 
I pull up at the gas station on uh, Wilcox. I think it was a Conoco. Pull up at that joint. As soon as I jump out, nigga like, damn, bro. Man, we heard about Shawty, man. Tell them we gonna, uh, we got some on this bun or something. I'm like, what, nigga? I'm finna go with my brother house now. That morning, I had got up and ran a couple of errors. Then I had got a call from my neighbor saying that the house just had got hit, and which I didn't believe him. So I ended up going back to the house. I parked like three streets down and walked down the street. And that's when I seen all the, uh, the FBI, the ATF agents out in the yard and killed one of the dogs, Hot Boy. But then it got to the point to where like, uh, and we still doing music and we were, we were releasing music and we doing shows and we doing our business, but it started being a lot going on around the label. A lot of the artists and a lot of the entourage niggas was catching cases. You get what I'm saying? I feel like it was the label was always on the rocks because of the cats that was affiliated. Like that's why I feel like we was always on the watch and I knew that we was always on the watch. Should have shot the butcher caught a fed case. Uh, Big Jerrell caught a robbery case. OG Laddall, he violated his parole. He went back to the pen. Big Mike caught a murder case. Uh, Mookie Mac ended up catching a dope. He got bum rushed. He caught a dope case. You know what I'm saying? So all this is going on around the label while we're still trying to do music. I was at Brush Mountain. Me and uh, a guy named Mookie, he was on the phone with his mom, and his mom said that one of the federal agents was up there at the store on uh, Dots. They were talking about Shorty P. They finna get to go and get Shorty P. They let them know that, man, get out of there, they coming. The next day, you heard they got it. You know what I mean? My thought of it was like, damn, they got my brother. Well, when you try to mix Biggs with Screech, something eventually gonna happen. You can't mix uh, Screech with business, man. You can do. You can only do it for so long. The feds got Vinny the Shark in 2001. And from that point on, they was watching the label right there. That was the reason why I never signed with film was because I seen from afar, and it might have been my opinion at the time, it might have been, you know what I'm saying, but I just seen that, it, you know what I'm saying, it just wasn't gonna land. Generally it doesn't work, man. At, at some point, even if you a street cat, and you know, you built your leverage in the streets, once you get your business moving, you gotta get away from that. When they don't roll by this, that, and that, and that, and this, but I just thank God that I didn't know nothing about no dope, no guns, and none of that. I wasn't ever involved in that. I was just old square. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was going to school, on a road school. When the when the music business started to jump off, most of the exempt, they stopped drinking, they stopped smoking, they got focused on music. They put aside all of the, the stuff from your youth, all the stuff that's playing and focused on getting money. But homeboy knew, man. He knew, he knew what it was, man. It's just, it's just, it's just like that, man. It's, it's straight like that. The biggest mistake was when he shut the studio down in East Chattanooga and moved it in back of his house. When I heard they picked up Shorty, man, because everybody was telling Shorty not to put that damn fence up. He put that damn fence up, put that studio in his backyard, and we coming over there telling Shorty, man, what the hell you doing, bro? You know, but he started getting so many records, say he was buying these whips, he feeling good about himself, which you can't blame him, you know what I'm saying? But he got Holly Park looking like he ain't got them Hollywood, you know what I'm saying? Now all this attention is on the house right there. The, the, the studio was our outlet. This is where we're going to hang out. This is where we're going to do our thing. Now all this hanging out and doing our thing is at your house on top of, it, on top of everything else that's going on. When people see people being successful, people are going to start talking. They ain't getting that money from selling records. They ain't getting that money from doing shows. Even though you might be getting it like that. If if you moving weight and that's that's your that's how you funding your operation, okay, that's your start. But then at some point you're gonna have to get to a point because the feds are always gonna be watching because they want to know exactly what the fuck is going on, where's his revenue coming from, who are these cats, and they're gonna let you do. Whatever you want to do, they're going to watch you as long. They got plenty of time. They, they record is pretty damn good. They don't lose. To be straight up, you know, like the situation with fam, uh, you're putting a lot of people's lives and careers at stake. Look at everybody that's not came up in this game from Jay-Z, Young Jeezy. You look at them. They not still in the streets. So you cannot stay in the street. Stack your money up, do what you trying to do with it, and then go ahead and be legitimate about it. It ain't worth it. You gotta pick one passion that you love. Cause 
even me, just even being in the streets, nigga, I got fucked up so many times, lost so much money, and you probably done set, set yourself back on, on your goal, on what you're trying to do. Man, it ain't worth it. It don't matter how big you are in the industry or how small you are in the streets. Whenever you're trying to mix your streets with your business, it don't work. You got to choose one or the other. And it might sound weird. You can listen to the cats that made it. I mean, because they, they made it. But also listen to those dudes that almost made it. They went through the same shit. Matter of fact, they probably know a little bit more or they were not willing to do certain things that that, that cat that made it got into his position, they they gonna know a whole bunch of stuff. There's a whole bunch of tricks to the trade. Every people, every label, every organization that I've seen that's trying to mix streets and business that don't work. Look at the BMF situation. It didn't work. Streets and business. Look at the death row record situation. It didn't work. Streets and business. And I personally, when I moved to New Orleans, I saw what happened with another artist, BG from Cash Money, mixing streets and business. It, it just didn't work. Eventually, you're gonna lose to the streets. You know what I'm saying? And that same shit happened with Fam Records. It was totally legit when it came to the music, but it was still street activities going on around the label. When you're trying to mix street business with legitimate music business, it's volatile. It, it can get very dangerous. Focus on that music, man. Learn your craft. Study your craft. Leave that street shit alone. You know, if you got the ability to, uh, to do your craft, stick with it. Stick with it. Don't never give up. And that caught up, and we lost in the end because of that. So if you're a youngster who's looking at this, or you're a nigga who uh, trying to sell dope and rap, or trying to gang bang and rap, choose one or the other. You know what I'm saying? Because you can't do both. If you try to do both, it's going to run you high and you're going to lose. Hey, Brother, hey, Brother, hey, Kicking 